All right, so for this section, we are going to go ahead and compare and contrast uh, the different life stages for the life cycles of salmon, tuna, oyster, shrimp, giant clam, and grouper. Um, so we're going to talk specifically about those life stages, focusing on differences in morphology, habitat, behavior um, of each of the organisms. So full disclosure, I've, I told you guys in class, but I highly, highly, highly suggest that you just straight read this chapter. The book does an excellent job at grouping the information that you need to know for the entire unit by organism type. So um, again, I really hope you guys uh, do go ahead and read that. First one we're going to talk about is the salmon. So. Salmon are unique in that they start and end their lives in freshwater rivers. Um, salmon are unique in the fish world. Um, not completely unique, but it's uh, unique in the ones that we're going to talk about um, because there are distinct male and female sexes, um, and they actually also show differences in sexual morphology when it gets to breeding time, which you guys will uh, see pictures of. So. The adult salmon are in the out in the sea, and they migrate up the rivers. Um, so if we're going to follow the diagram here, uh, they reach sexual maturity after about four years, and they return to rivers for spawning events. Um, so these little dark uh, items right here, this is um, like the rocky bed of the river. This is important because the females actually go ahead and lay their eggs before the males uh, come and fertilize. So the females lay their eggs in these uh, little nests called reds, um, which are just like little rocky uh, pebble areas that the, they used for protection for their um, offspring. The males will come and fertilize that. So they will swim directly over what the females have just put down and they will fertilize there. Why is that important? Because the males almost directly fertilize the female's eggs, which creates a higher ratio of fertilized to unfertilized eggs, as opposed to some of the other life cycles we're going to see later, where the male and female just kind of let it all out and hope that, um, uh, that hope that egg and sperm run into each other in the water. This is a little bit more proximal. It's not quite as guaranteed as internal fertilization, but the, it does create a higher uh, chance of fertilization occurring. Um, from that, the 11s are the first larval stage of these organisms. Um, they are characterized because they, they pretty much don't swim, and they, sit, st they remain in that uh, gravel area that, or underneath the gravel, um, and they don't eat anything. They just, if you notice in that picture, they have a little bulb underneath them. That is a yolk sac, and you'll see a picture of that in a minute. Um, and they use, they feed off of that for a little while after they, um, after they hatch. Um, once their yolk sac is gone, uh, they do start to develop into um, a fry stage. The fry are. Um, still lar considered larval, larval organisms, um, but they are now feeding on their own, and they're growing very quickly at this stage. From there, they develop into par. Par um, begin to are characterized by uh, the fact that they're larger and that they begin to develop uh, camouflage on their bodies. Um, they live in the river for up to four years. Um, so again, they start to develop that camouflage between the fry and the par stage as they are needing to kind of come up. And um, the camouflage prevents them from uh, being hunted by predators as readily. From par to smolt, smolt is the last um, phase. It would be considered the juvenile phase. Um, the smolt are going to uh, start to develop. They start to lose their uh, par markings and they develop a silver coloration and they live in estuaries so they're not in completely fresh water now they're living in estuaries also you're going to notice that the organisms start to shoal in uh, these stages so they start to come together 
So once this smolt uh, go ahead and get rid of their coloration, they start to develop a silver coloration. This is because um, when they move out into the sea, that silver coloration actually is better camouflage. So um, they'll migrate out to the sea where they will develop into adult and they feed on uh, larger organisms. Uh, once they reach sexual maturity, the cycle begins again. So what's important to notice here is that at every single life stage, competition between organisms of the same species at different life stages is minimized by them having a different habitat and or a different uh, prey item. So that's a really important concept moving forward in this unit. Um, like I think I mentioned before, it is important for each of these organisms that you recognize what habitat they are in. So you might need to say that salmon, adult salmon are in the open ocean while the adult spawning salmon are in the rivers and that the 11s through the pars are in the rivers, smolts are in the estuaries, and then it, like you might have to fill out a table that has just asking you where each of those organisms exist. Um, and then you also might have to state why it's important that they live in specific uh, habitats. All right, so we're just going to go ahead and do a little bit of practice here. I don't do a ton of individualized practice, but salmon, um, they tend to ask, I've seen questions before where they ask a little bit more about their morphology. So the 11, you can see here, I told you that they have that yolk sac. You can see the yolk sac attached in this one. Um, and feel free to pause at any time um, to write this stuff down or read more of what I've written. Um, but again, this is the 11. You can notice that it's on the gravel here. So this is actually the red. Uh, these are small gravel pieces here. Notice they're not swimming, right? <clears throat> All right, the fry, notice the difference here. We were on the bottom for the 11. Now we are up swimming with the fry, and you see there is no more yolk sac here. You can start to see a tiny bit of camouflaging happening here. Um, and these guys are um, going to not be very good uh, swimmers yet, they are just now getting off the ground. So um, their goal is to develop really quickly through this stage where they're super, super vulnerable to predators. Um, if you notice, up to 90% actually do not make it past this stage. All right, par, you can see those super developed uh, markings there, the bars. Um, so the par bars exist on them. Uh, they stay in the stage and grow for up to four years. Um, and again, we're still in the river here, but notice we are, look how many there are in this area here. So we are shoaling in the par life stage. Smolts, um, again, notice they are more silver in coloration and they have lost the bars. Um, so they are a more uniform color. Um, and they move out to the estuaries in this. So one thing I've seen is making the connection between last unit and this unit. Um, you might be asked, to discuss how when they move from the par stage to the smolt stage, how they are able to do that and what challenges they might meet. And the answer to that is uh, the challenge of changing salinities and they have to, again, reverse their ion pumps or change the directions of their ion pumps. So from fresh water, they are pumping ions in. As they move into saltier water, they might have to reverse and push those out. All right, and at this point, we are moving out into the open ocean. We have adult salmon here, and I told you they are unique because they are sexually dimorphic. There's not a lot of fish out there that you can tell the difference between male and female, um, but you can for the salmon. You can also tell a difference in the sexually mature salmon, which is interesting. Um, so they feed on uh, other fish in the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, depending on uh, the region that they're from and the species. Uh, there's lots of different species of salmon. Uh, we're not going to talk about those species individually until later. Um, but again, a key point on this is that male and female are different, and they cannot change sexes ever. So if they're born males, they remain males until spawning, until they die, and same with females. All right. Tuna. Tuna are um, 
going to be a little bit different. They spend their entire lifetime in the sea and the entire lifetime out in the open ocean. So um, they don't move uh, from the open ocean to the coastline and back like some of the other organisms we're going to see. They move up and down in the water column. Um, so the these are major shoalers. We've already talked about that. They reduce. They produce uh, millions of eggs in every spawning event. Um, the fertilized eggs hatch very quickly um, because they want to one be able to start feeding, and two, they're really vulnerable when they're just floating around, embryos floating around there. Um, the eggs float to the surface, and again, um, this makes them plankton themselves, but they also feed on phytoplankton. So floating to the surface helps them be closer to the food items that they're going to take in. Uh, these guys, the larvae, once they start to develop, they grow very rapidly. And they are, um, it only takes them a couple weeks to be considered juvenile stage tuna. Um, once they're juveniles, they're going to be feeding on uh, small fish, crustaceans, and mollusks, and they reach sexual maturity within, um, within one year. So that is pretty quick for, um, for a fish. Um, oh, that's salmon. All right, I'm going to skip to tuna here since we're talking about that. Um, so what's important to notice here, again, the um, larvae are going to be in the surface waters here, while the juvenile are going to actually live in the spawning ground. So they are going to, between the larval stage here at the surface and the juvenile stage, they are going to migrate um, to the spawning grounds in this. So this, because their life stages uh, are moving so quickly between juvenile and adult, they want to be kind of getting together with other, um, other organisms of the same species and the same size. So they kind of group together by size in these areas. Um, they move from the shoaling ground or from the, um, spawning grounds into the open ocean uh, while they are not actively spawning. Um, and this is where they feed and shoal and just live life. Um, and then they go back to the spawning grounds. They return to the spawning grounds to spawn. And then um, the adults don't die after this. They would then go back out here, back and forth. So their total lifespan is about 25 years. Um, and this is the life cycle of a tuna. All right, shrimp. Um, shrimp are, <coughs> excuse me. Shrimp are going to, uh, we're going to start talking about adults again. Um, shrimp do external fertilization, but it's not considered broadcast spawning. So again, broadcast spawning is what tunas do. They just kind of let everything release into the ocean. Uh, shrimp are a little different. The male and female actually do have to couple in order to mate. So the eggs, the female actually hangs onto the eggs on the outside of her body and the male fertilizes them that way. Again, this method ensures um, a greater likelihood of fertilization. It doesn't necessarily mean that more fertilized eggs are going to live to adulthood, but it does ensure a greater chance of fertilization. Notice again, the fertilized eggs are going to be my uh, floating towards the surface of the water where they will become plankton. It helps them because they their food source is also at that surface layer of the water. Um, they are a prey item up here, but they, because they are in so such a high number, it's okay that um, they're vulnerable and in that area where all the other things are tr also trying to eat plankton. Um, it's why these types of organisms that uh, don't have any real parenting strategies end up creating so many eggs and sperm to start with it so that hopefully at least something can survive to adulthood. All right, so the Nauplius is here. That's the first uh, larval stage. Um, they are going to feed in the surface water. They go through several different metamorphoses before they get to the um, post-larval and juvenile stages um, where they start to resemble shrimp. So we go through Nauplius and Zoea stage um, that have really similar behaviors. They live in the same area. 
Um, we move to the mysis stage. At the mysis stage is when they start to um, move towards the coast. So they rely on ocean currents to bring them towards the coast. Because they're starting out in the deeper water here, it takes a little bit for them to, the currents to bring them all the way out here from the deep water into the uh, coastal water. So mysis shrimp are going to, again, still be in the surface water, but be migrating towards the coast uh, via ocean currents. The post larva stage is going to exist in the mangroves and the estuaries. And it does this in order to, um, one, have a greater food source, and two, have the protection of, um, you know, the seagrass and the mangrove areas while it uh, develops. So these, it takes full advantage of that nursery stage, and then it migrates back towards the deeper ocean, um, the juvenile stage, uh, migrate from those estuaries into the ocean um, where they will eventually be sexually mature adults and then start the cycle over again. Again, it's important to recognize why they are in different habitats at different life stages. Um, the two overarching uh, reasons are because it reduces competition for both space and food with other life stages. All right, for the oysters, this is probably the one that's going to be the most difficult vocabulary, but I've noticed that this is not, this does not necessarily tend to be a focus uh, point. Um, it is good to know them because you can pick up marks by knowing these, but I don't think it is 100% essential in being proficient in this unit. All right, so adult oysters. Um, adult oysters are separate sexes, but they have the ability to change their sex during their lives. So these guys are considered a type of hermaphrodite, but for ACE purposes, it's important to just say that they can change sex during their life um, and not necessarily call them a hermaphrodite. All right, so um, oysters live together. You guys have all seen oyster beds. They're oyster beds for a reason because it, um, it makes it easier to successfully spawn. All right, so they coordinate the release of egg and sperm. Egg and sperm uh, float um, around and the fertilized egg will eventually float to the surface of the water. Um, that fertilized egg is going to um, develop into a trochophore. The trochophore is um, essentially just a mobile embryo. Um, that right there is cilia, it allows them to really basically swim a little bit. It allows them to move around in the water column. Um, these guys are considered plankton. Again, they're living in the surface water and they're feeding on other plankton, probably mostly phytoplankton. Uh, the villager stage is the next, the next stage and this is where they start to develop their shell. Um, it is not a full shell. They just may or may not slightly resemble the adult phase but they are still, um, they still have that cilia there to swim around with, but they now have developed a partial shell still in the surface water. The pedivelager is the next stage, pedi meaning foot. So this is the stage where they develop a foot and you can see the foot right there. Feet in marine mussels, or well, mussels in general, uh, clams, oysters, any of those things, um, allow them to kind of dig and help themselves settle into the ground. Um, because that's where their adult phases are on the sea floor. The early spat um, and the later spat, it, I don't need you to know the difference between those. Spat in general is the life stage that settles. So this part here should not say setting, it should say settling. Um, they settle to the ground, which means that they attach to substrate. Um, they attach to substrate near other oysters, and um, the goal is to be able to um, eventually be able to spawn successfully. So if you attach with other oysters, you can uh, better ensure your chance of uh, passing on your genes later. These, or, these areas, because these guys are filter feeders, these areas have to be high in nutrients, typically have a lot of water flow going on, like bay areas that experience like uh, daily tide changes. <coughs> so oyster life cycle. All right, giant clam life cycle. Uh, Ace loves the giant clam. 
loves, loves, loves the giant clams. So the adults live on the seabed. They are uh, they are permanently stuck to the bottom. They they put themselves in the bottom. They bury when they are very tiny, um, and they uh, with their foot, and then once they turn into adults, they essentially have no ability to move. Like normal clams can dig around. These guys, once they anchor themselves and pick a spot, they're there for life. So giant clams are sim simultaneous hermaphrodites, which means that they are male and female at the same time. And this is an important, um, this is important for the giant clam and for you to understand that for the giant clam for several reasons. Um, a benefit in general of being a hermaphrodite, it makes it easier to find a mate. Think cost per versus benefit ratio. If there's not that many giant clams hanging out around you and you're like, oh shoot, I anchored here for life and there are no other females around, what am I gonna do? Well, good thing you're a giant clam because you have both parts and you can still sexually reproduce. You're still successful. Um, so that is why that strategy exists. It's because they anchor for life and they're not necessarily in a, a big colony like the oysters are. So they release sperm first and then the egg. Um, like other organisms like oysters, uh, the presence of egg and sperm gametes in general in the water, but traditionally sperm, um, the presence of the sperm in the water uh, signals the any other organ any other organisms of the same species in the area that, hey, it's time to spawn. So the sperm is released first, the egg follows, um, a fertilized egg develops again into a trochophore, and then into a veliger, and then a pedivelliger, and then a spat. So you're going to notice that these are really similar in general life cycles. Um, the major difference between the two is um, that oysters are um, male-female, uh, but can switch back and forth, um, whereas giant clams are um, are simultaneous hermaphrodites, meaning that they possess both male and female uh, gamete production capabilities at the same time. All right, and uh, so on this, if you're looking at the diagram, you really only have to pay attention until you get to here, juvenile. This is um, referring to aquaculture, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of... Um, diagrams that do a good job of explaining the uh, giant clam life cycle. All right, so sorry that was so long, but we are done with the basics of the life cycles. Again, I cannot stress to you more how important it is for you guys to actually read the book in this unit. The pages for this that you're going to want to read are pages 198 to 215. All right, 198 to 215, and you guys need to go ahead and map out the life cycles with that extra information for the um, all of the organisms. I gave you guys the starter packets for three of the organisms. You guys need to follow up on the other organisms on your own.